Awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to your future leaders today. Call, we think it's 69. We're going to go with 69, but it might not be. So don't guarantee on it. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm here with Richard as well. Together we run Future Leaders Today and we help people transition from no experience within crypto into somewhere where we can have our little water wings and we can float around and we can swim and we can chat and we can squirt water at each other fairly safely. And this is, from our perspective, the greatest transference in wealth we have ever seen and it's the possibly at least one of the best opportunities we have in humanity to have a a more fairer system within and around, at the very least, finance, but data and information and various other things. If you think the it's internet the had a big impact on society, then um, a blockchain will have an even greater impact on that. So what we try and do within this space is pull it all together so that we can have a space where we can discuss it. And we have these calls every couple of weeks just to open it up and um, like anything, when as soon as there's a space where we can talk and we can share, we all grow and we all rise. So we want to increase adoption and increase use. And so that's what we hope these calls can help to do for everybody. So um, I'm going to have pulled up um, everyone's questions here. Now, this call was specifically for uh, wallets, exchanges, risks and security. So what I, but before we realized is, is I also want to understand how many people are specifically like on the call for that purpose versus general crypto news, uh, because that lets me understand, that helps us understand how much time we'll spend on that. Um, because fundamentally with any of the calls, we'd rather them always be about whatever they need to be about. But the themes are good. They give us like a bit, a bit of an anchor. So um that's going to be my question to everyone in a minute. But before I do that, I want to just capture anyone that's new. Carla, I think she shared last week, but if you don't mind, Carla, in a, in a minute, if you give me just a 30 second run through, because we have a bit of a gap. Mine's a bit, uh, I just want to catch up. Everyone else I'm cool with. Lottie, is this your first call? It's not, is it? No, it's my second. But I have been Are you, did, not very did active. Did you come in on this last week. time? Yeah, did you come on last time and want to get into NFT, um, right. NFT the artist. artist? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Okay, cool. And um, I thought, obviously, I'm about to mint my first NFT next week, but also there has been a big hack of, uh, in the NFT communities in wallets. So it's kind of relevant, both. But I'm really here also to ask about if anybody's got any experience, uh, in, you know, investing in NFTs. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to capture some of these. Just give me a second. We're, we're doing, it might be, some of the calls might be a little bit slower from now on just because we realize that all these calls we're recording by not, we're not capturing what we're talking about and things. It makes things really difficult for people to um, find what they want to look at further down the line. You know, it's good to be able to type in something NFTs and know that these calls we discuss it. So, um, so really, what you've got there is um, you've got a question there on NFTs with regards to um, an experience in them in general, and then also you're talking about a recent hack. A recent hack on wallets in NFT space. Uh, that's new to me, uh, but I've literally been away for weeks in retreats. When you say it's a hack on wallets, what wallets are they? Let me just um, go on Twitter. So I say this. That's right. cool. That's um, cool. You, you I, dig. I thought it You uh, dig that I, up. I, yeah, I thought it was MetaMask. Okay, have a quick look on there whilst I just speak to Carla for a minute and then we'll come back um, because it's good to, especially if we're talking about wallets and risks and security, that's a really good um, live point. Um, so Carla, you definitely did share, but please refresh my mind again, my dear. Um, just 30 seconds where you're at um, in your general crypto journey. Sure. Um, I feel like I'm in kindergarten still just learning a lot and, and trying to just understand the terminology and language and whatnot. 
But um, I think I was a little bit disenchanted after the, the crash a couple of weeks ago and, and in some different, another group I'm in, everybody talking about this, you know, the, the bots and AI are manipulating everything and how things are kind of wonky and institutions. And, you know, it was like, oh, I thought this was the point that people wanted to get away from some of that. Um, so I think I'm just much more cautious now. And I just watched a video the other day that Tether has like nothing behind it. And that's kind of a funny business. So um, I'm just listening. And, and, and even today, I'm, I'm doing some errands and things like that around the house while I'm just listening because I, I want to learn, but I'm, I'm not rushing in. I'm, I'm not really active right now, but um, that's where I'm at. Cool. No worries. And just a quick one. Did you, because uh, I've just found your notes from last time, last time you were asking about um, cold, moving stuff to cold storage, how to move it. You Do you already own some crypto? I do. And you know what? I haven't even moved it over to the, um, I haven't moved it. To, I was going to move it to the, the bit that I have to a um, an interest earning um, okay. platform, or like, a, what is it? Celsius or, or Celsius. Nexo. So, that's on yeah. my list of things to uh, do. I just where, and where, where is your crypto at the minute? Um, it's on, I think, KuCoin and I can't remember the other one. There's two, two different exchanges. I just have a little bit on. Okay, cool. That's fine. Yeah. It's nice to keep. And just to see, make sure it's not on anything too, um, too nefarious. Okay, so that's cool. Thank you, Carla. Keep doing your errands. I hope you enjoy um, <laughs> uh, the call. Okay? Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. So, uh, Lottie, did you find out a bit more information? Yep, cool. Do you want to share? So, it was MetaMask that it was hacked. Um, and I could see that one of the artists, and he's a very successful artist, lost 200k from his uh, MetaMask wallet. Um, and I think how it started. I don't, uh, you know, I only saw it very briefly while it was a hack unfolding it was somebody approaching nft artists to buy their work and somebody you know sending a link so it was private dms mm -hmm. um and then yeah and it is yeah it, is this is it. this the april 20th hack i don't know let me just okay okay well up. Either way, that looks that sounds like a social engineering hack, yeah. Mm. Social engineering. So what did you call it? So it's a so a social engineering hack is when um, think of it like this: you've got two types of hacks. You have a, a a technical hack where someone is exploiting a weakness in in the code, let's say, and coming in through back doors and. Um, like, like the, the, the way we grow up thinking of hacks, some, some geek in a computer sending viruses and stuff like that. Um, the other type of a hack is a social engineering hack where you, the, the back door is the human being. Uh, the, the biggest one that ever happened where they had a really big, big hack was they um, dropped a lot of CDs. Uh, well, not a lot, but they dropped CDs in a car park of a big blue chip firm that said um, company salaries 2017. And obviously you only need a particular employee who's really curious to pick up that CD as he's walking into work that day, put it into his computer because he wants to look at the salaries of everyone in the company. And as soon as that CD spun up, boom. So that's a sort, actually that's not necessarily a social engineering, but social engineering is more specifically these days is where you target somebody and you um, slowly gain pieces of information, you're building trust to get in through the human being. But both, the, the thing that's rel relative to both of those last two stories is the back door is the human. Whether they, whether they unknowingly just put a CD in, which is the old school way, or the new school way is you start talking with someone and, oh, here's a link, click the link, those sorts of things. You're, you're engineering a hack through social connections rather than hacking an IP address with technical code. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and for everyone on this call, social engineering hacks are absolutely the biggest hacks that are going on right now. The last company I ran, we had a large, well, our customer had a large social engineering hack. 
um, and we were the victim of it, paying him. Um, so although he had the social engineering hack, we were the ones that lost the money. And because we sent the money, the bank were like, whoa, it's not the bank's fault, it's your fault, which it is our fault. And um, he had no idea that he was being hacked and was speak and we were ended with we, we were speaking to the hacker in theory rather than speaking to the client. And because the hacker was well aware of the money that was moving between us, he just perfectly came in and intercepted one of the payments, got it moved to another bank account. You know, everything looked totally normal. So it's it's it can happen at any single stage. Um, and this is why just never just in crypto, just never click on a link. In an email or a dm it's so e and it's so easy at the moment to do it because they're getting wrote quite oh, clever easy. the worst ones at the moment if you're in any groups for about any sort of cryptos or any sort of you know information you're trying to acquire at the moment in telegram and um people people just private dm dming you on, on telegram i get it all the time basically just delete those as quickly as possible if you haven't asked anyone for any contact information directly just delete it off your phone straight away basically because it's uh, yeah. pretty insidious and there's stuff. um there's a, a crypto news channel coindesk and the people that send the social engineering hacks actually send out emails newsletters yeah. from coindesk and they look if you i get coindesk Perfect. emails right and I, I now know I've trained my, my email client to put, uh, I whitelist their address. Most of the spam ones go into Coindesk. Um, but you can spot the hack ones because, so they're sending this newsletter out and it's a really positive newsletter that contains real news that's relevant to today. But then one of the articles will be something like any coin, XIP, Cardano, Ethereum, are giving away you know, 100 Ethereum, uh, all you have to do is download their new wallet and, uh, and the first 100,000 people to do it that fund the wallet with at least one Ethereum will be in a draw to win 100 Ethereum. So you think it's coming from Coindesk. It looks very legitimate. It's got all the news that you're seeing on Twitter, you know, all the news that's circulating for this week, for today, but one article in it will be about something else. You'll click on that. It'll take you to a web page that looks just like Coindesk. You'll download a wallet. They'll give you some seed phrases. You'll put your, you'll load it with one Ethereum and it's gone. And you think about how many millions of people, and, and I've clicked on some of those links. And I've been staring at them going, it can't, and then I'll click it and I'll look at it. And then I go straight to Twitter. And that's when I'll, I'll go to Ethereum and check something. And, Twitter is a good source of identifying if something is legitimate, I have to say, um, because you can clearly see that you're, you're looking at the, um, the Twitter account or something like that, but you've got to be super careful. So in reference to this, uh, this hack for this NFT hack, it, it's not really an NFT hack. It's, it's a, it's a hacker who's exploiting probably the fact that whoever the end of these artists are might not have the best security or just might not be up to date with what's going on. And he's just basically just exploiting them. And that can happen to anyone in any space, whether you're in crypto or not. Uh, it's just a lot easier in crypto because you don't have the checks that a bank has. So try not, try not to necessarily let you become disheartened by that. If anything, we should just get hardened by it and it lets us go okay so then what would i do if i received that email and a direct message um because it sounds like he installed some software from the links that i from the articles i just saw the dm sent him something to install and th and that has created the exploit is that what you saw as well latte Yeah, no, I just kind of glanced at really uh, because there was so much talk about it. I wasn't um, something anyway. Can you can you send the, a link well, to it so I can just have a look? Uh, yes, let me just see because I was just throw like it, throw it into uh, the um, throw it 
throw it into the thingy because as we're chatting and we're going through it, I'll just keep, I'll just delve into it a little bit more. Um, yeah. But the also, one I just we'll found on. Yeah. What, carry on. Yeah, no. Um, the kind of advice that was also given was to kind of log out of your MetaMask on your phone mm. uh, and not have it open all the time. Um, um, I'm not too sure. To log out of MetaMask on your phone. I mean, the, the, this does come down to someone once said, like, you know, what's more secure, a phone or a laptop? And I think me and Jerry have talked about this on, on prior calls. Like, my view is in, in general, a phone is more secure because to have apps cross talking to each other and, and sending commands is a lot harder to do on a phone than on a laptop. However, if your phone is really out of date um, and is, you know, does have some more nefarious apps on it and your laptop's more up to date and is Linux or Mac, then I would say the laptop's more secure. So there's, there's a few things within it. I, I have, having an iPhone um, for my crypto, I've got less concern over this app forcing something out of this app but if you're going to click a link and that link has got commands built into it that opens up metamask that then starts a um a transaction you just have to click confirm being logged out of it would prevent that but it's not going to prevent you from receiving a, a social engineering hack from me and clicking a link that's still if you if you're willing to click that link and even if you're logged out you'd probably just log in because you're clicking the link to execute whatever you think's happening. Does, does that kind of make sense? Like just having MetaMask logged in on your phone, uh, rule number one in crypto with tech, have good technology, make sure it's up to date. Like you, 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 this, is, this is sovereign money, sovereign finance. There is no person we can go crying to. So it's like you're dealing with a form of digital currency that runs on technology. If you're using old devices that are susceptible to malware and things on your device, that's a threat. Um, and I think sometimes there's the, like, there's the level of your technical capability, there's the level of your tech, there's the level you need out your tech. And all of them at the very least, um, you, you can have more technical knowledge, but how good your tech is and what you need out of it need to at least be equal. If not higher, I'd probably say these two need to be higher than this one. And so long as this one's always the lowest and these two are higher, you'll always know enough and have good enough technology. Um, can I ask you a question? So I was recommended to actually get malware by four iPhones on my phone as well as an additional security thing. I mean, I've got it on my phone. Yeah, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll open this up. I, I've. I mean, as much I, as I don't I'm like. Not, I'm not in a risk at the moment because I'm not trading. I'm not doing anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't really need to be logged in anywhere. But I think moving forward, and also I've um, dragged out an old computer, but I'm going to, that I'm going to do to kind of make a crypto uh, computer. I'm going to update it and, uh, you know, like get everything and just keep everything separate. But yeah, this malware bytes. Anybody who uses it on well, your let, iPhone? Let, let's open that up because, because I've, I've used malware bytes. My, my view now is, and I'm about to move to two phones for crypto, a completely separate one. I'm looking at using graphene operating system. Um, and completely locking it down from a privacy perspective. But for now, like I made the decision a while ago, I flicked between Apple and Google and all sorts of stuff. I rest on Apple because I trusted in general out the box to be far more secure than an out the box Android device. That's my general rule on things. Um, and I don't run any antivirus or malware on either of my Apple devices at all. Um, but I'm incredibly conscious of what apps I install. Um, I won't even install like, you know, like sticker packs 
to help you make gifts and send stuff. I don't, none of that because of the permissions that they have. So I'm very cautious of what goes on the phone, but I, I don't, from everything I've read, I don't think you really need things like that on your phone, but let's open it up because I know Jerry's quite a big tech dude. Richard might have a view and others might do as well. So I don't know if, um, Richard, have you got any view on it before we move over to Jerry? Have you thought, heard anything from your connections? I mean, I don't use, uh, I am Google out of the box currently. And we've talked before that, um, you know, we're both moving to, to, you know, I'll have my crypto phone and access. I'm going to have my, everything else will be on another phone. So that's quite a big thing to kind of move, but it's a good practice. Yeah. Um, from personal perspective, I have VPNs on, on things and all the different um, options that they have in there. And there. I don't think there's anything wrong with having some of these things on it. Some people might have views on which ones you trust over others. Um, but it's certainly good practice to start getting into because this is going to become more and more of an issue. So the, the sooner you start practicing things, you'll find better things along the way. People recommend, well, this virus software is better or you don't need this if you're doing that. I think the thing you touched on there in terms of logging out of things and using 2FA and, and just securing absolutely everything, it makes your life difficult, but that's the way we're stepping into with this where it's more responsibility um, and this is the price we pay. It's less convenient, but you know, you own your own, you own your own money, and you, you've got your own responsibilities around that. So I, I, I think it's down to personal preference. I think we have to sort of recognise what we're, where we're willing to go with it. You own, you're going to kick yourself at some point if you fall for any of these things or you lose something, and you think, I wish I'd done that. So I think I haven't got any particular advice because I do think, as you pointed out, everyone has got. A different level where they where they go to with these things but i think you have to think about um I, I, the way i look at it is each place that i go to in crypto it's kind of it's isolated so i'll go to that place and if i'm not using it in the next 10 minutes i'll log out of it again you know what i mean i'll log out of it and make my life difficult to go back into it and, and therefore it's more difficult for anyone to go in. i think that that's a good starting point it's just making sure you're not logged into anything anywhere, having every single security measure that you can have on anything because social engineering or not, that's going to make things extremely difficult for anyone that's accessing your, you know, your devices to do, to do that. Um, but I think in terms of installing extra levels of malware protection, I, I'd say, why not? Why would you not do it? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's still down to personal preference. Cool. And just before I ask Jerry as well, I think I've just found this um, this hack. Was it an SCR file, Lottie? Does that ring a bell, what you've been seeing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what it was, was people were direct messaging people with effectively the same thing as a zip file. Uh, and then people were opening that file on their computer and opening it. So this is exactly the same as the CD that I sent. I said where people would leave CDs or USB pens, you know, outside Sony, and it would say Sony company accounts 2019, and people would put it in, and they would open the files on them, um, zip files, SCR files, any sort of files, RAR files that are compressed that contain lots of information, and then you open them and unzip them, um, are nefariously standard ways of exploiting devices like ridiculously so they've probably used scr because people didn't know what it was um and then as soon as they've opened that on their computer that's it, it it's done and so then this this response of if you weren't logged in you wouldn't have lost the money is accurate because if this file if this file goes to then automatically open up a browser go to metamask send money to this address if you're not logged in it can't do it um so uh, it is an easy answer to say, well, don't be logged in, but, the, but that doesn't fix the problem. The problem is, like Richard said earlier, if you get a direct message from someone, I just like all alarm bells need to be up. The same way you're walking down a street, it's late at night and three people come up to you and say, hey, you know, and start talking to you. It's just being a bit more cautious of things because in crypto... Um, 
uh, there's a lot that can be done within that space. So it's just, especially if you have to, if you have to open a file, click a link and open a file should be like, just stop, stop altogether. Um, Jerry, I'd love your view from a tech perspective between laptops and phones. Um, and, um, Malware. You know, malware, security, viruses, stuff like that. You got any uh, any bits you'd love to just pass on, bro? Well, good morning, first of all. At least it's morning where I am. Um, and I may not be as technical as you think. I've been in crypto for a while, but I'm still um, I'm still as confused as the next person when I try to make something happen and it doesn't. <laughs> I think <laughs> going. Okay, um, okay. I know... I know I've clicked on wrong links. I know I've been scammed of money before. Um, you know, and just having been in the space for a couple of years, it's um, it's been in, it's it's almost inevitable. Like I, you know, I hate to say it's um, it's a learning step, but so many people have been burned of something, or they're convinced to to send something somewhere, and it turns out to be a scam. And and you know, it's it's. Um, I don't know. It's not inevitable, but it happens to so many people. I think the safe thing is just don't trust anybody. I think the advice everybody's giving is fine. Um, you know, and it's something it's beyond fine. It's, it's don't trust people. Don't click on links, look after yourself, you know, and that's, that's part of the basic room tone level of stress that I have looking after my own finances, you know, it's, and it's been, it's been a, um, it, you know, it's been like even my phone, um, Richard, you mentioned 2FA, like that's what I have of my Google, you know, and I may have 2FA on maybe eight or 10 different accounts, you know, something like that. Like I know I have to scroll through a lot of, uh, a lot of accounts when I'm deciding which I'm going to get my PFA for. So just the stress of losing my phone and I've, oh. I've lost my phone before and I've had to reset up my T my, my Google TFA. And if you haven't, when you say you're setting up, say you're going to bit or Bittrex or Binance or wherever you've got your two, your two FA set up. If you didn't um, save the QR code in however people save their files, um, there's a QR code for a simple restore of your two FA. Hmm. Um, and if you haven't logged that, or if you haven't reported that for every single one of your 2FA accounts, if you do lose your phone, you have to make appeals to the actual exchange. You have to go through your CMYK, or C CMYK, here's my old uh, <laughs> art director days. You're, um, <laughs> but you know, you have, to, you have to confirm all your identity again, right? So, but if you have your Google TFA um, restore, set up i think it's well worth the time you know for people who are who who do it if they haven't done it before if they haven't gone through but that's just part of the you know the stress thing i've lost my tfa i've had to go through and it might take a week and a half to two weeks i'm sitting there you know with um okx trying to um do things over over the um um uh skype you know, and showing my my passport only because I lost my phone and my two, and I had to restore my two my uh, yeah. Google two uh, FA. So, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to um, you know the point of security, I think it's I think it's smart, Richard. Like you said, why not put it on as long as you're comfortable with it and you don't mind the step. I don't. I I'm, I'm not sure of the thing that you're referring to with the. Um, you know, that security that you're talking about, like I say, I stick with 2FA and that's, that's kind of as deep as I go. I've got my passwords and, you know, and that's, that's, that's can, what I do. Can I ask you, to, uh, sorry, I don't knew, know what 2FA is. Uh, there's a thing that's called two-factor identification. Oh, right. Okay. And, yeah. I know what that is. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry yeah. to short form it. I should I should be more aware. Let, 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 let's just check, though, that that's not the same Lottie as OT. P one time passcode. Do you, so so that's why I just wanted to check. So to be without getting too techy, both of these are called MFA, multi-factor authentication. It means it means your first factor authentication is a username and a password. Yeah. Mm. And, and we're all used to that. So these MFA or 2FA is whereby there's a second level. But then yeah, like you a can page or 
you yeah, know, like so, a but, code but, on your phone. Th but this, this is where we want to separate it. When you move to second mm -hmm. level, the absolute weakest form of second level is a text message. Mm -hmm. So people, so people think they have like two FA set up, um, but really they have OTP set up, one time passcode, and they are they are quite easy to be um, to be hacked, to be uh, SIM swapped, to have all sorts of stuff done to them. Two FA is you might have seen. Have you ever heard of Google Authenticator or yes. Authy? Uh, so, I've got both. Authy. Yeah, and, I don't even yeah. know if you can see that. It's not going to change, is mm. it? No. So when you get that six, you get six numbers, and every thirty seconds they change. Yeah. Mm. That's that's what you want. Um, Authy and Google Authenticator are the same. They're using a very standard protocol. So everyone thinks when an app says download Google Authenticator that you have to use Google Authenticator. You do not. You can move everything over to Authy, and an Authy allows you to back up, which would solve what Jerry talks about. However, backing up has its own risks and threats as well. So I, I write down my two-factor authenticator code so that if I do get another phone, I've got a copy of it. But I also have a different system that I don't really share publicly, but privately I'll have conversations with people um, that backs up all of my two FAs. So if I was to lose my device, I have a method for them being stored elsewhere. So I don't, I don't need the code when you first go and create a 2FA, it'll give you a, a unique code. When you put that code into Authy or Google Authenticator, it's now set up. And if you keep that code, it means you could set it up on any other devices. Most people never save it. If you, and so what Jerry's talking about is saving this so that in future you've got a copy of it. But you can have multi-factor authenticator apps that, that also sync and back up to other places. And then you've always got copies of them as well. Um, it, 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 every one of these solutions solves something, but everything it solves usually raises another factor of risk that you need to think about because of any device that backs up and syncs means it's now connected to the cloud which has another threat factor you know someone could hack that how safe is it who's got access to it all these other questions um so there's there's no magic red pill to solve all this but i will say this through having awareness of it and understanding it and again going back to those three levels your technical capability the quality of your technology, what you actually need. And the absolute least, you as a human being must always know more or, or the absolute least equal to what you need. Because if it does this, you are the biggest threat. Hmm. If you need this much security, if you're managing you know, a couple of hundred K, um, and that's all, all your money, yeah? Then that's a high amount of risk if, like, if you lost that. If your skill level is here, this gap between the two is, is worth a lot of money. If you're managing uh, 100 pounds and you're just tinkering in crypto and, it's, and it's, it's not worth that much to you and you, you, you could lose it and you're okay, then you could, you could have the same skill level as when you had a 200K but the, the risk of 200K is greater than the 10 pound. So you've got to look at how, where your knowledge is at. And unfortunately in crypto, so many people just start getting into it. And if you were born before 1990, before 1987, something like that, you know, my experience as a person that teaches tech is that the majority of people in that age bracket and older uh, have a poor relationship with technology. And, and that's not good when you're moving into crypto. And that's the biggest thing that needs to be um, increased. So I just share all that. I've got some smiles coming there from Roddy, probably has seen that in other spaces as well. So it's just, it's just, it's just really thinking about it. And it's not there to scare you or anything like that, but it is a, when me and Richard put together our nine path program, one of the big ones is all about that. Like you've got to be really cool with where am I at? And that's why sometimes having your money on an exchange is actually safer than having your money in a cold wallet. Because at least on an exchange with KYC, 
If you lose all your data, all your details, you can go back to them with your passport and say, I've lost my 2FA. I've lost my password. I've lost my email account. But here's my passport. And through, through hook or by crook and lots of contacts, you will be able to gain access to your account. But if you've got a cold wallet that uses a seed phrase and you've put a 25th word in and you've split it in half and you've given half to your mum and half to your brother and you lose some of that, foobard, I think is the technical term, which means um, fucked up beyond all recognition. Is that right? Anyone heard that before? <laughs> to to totally screwed. Um, and that's because the level of technical that you went to with seed phrases and 25 words and splitting it was greater than your capability to manage it. In which case, an exchange would have been better. So that's where when people say, oh, cold wallet's better than an exchange, I'm like, not, not necessarily. When you say cold wallet, you mean when you take it on those USB things or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like a, a special a special device that is absolutely unhackable because it's cold, it's not connected to the internet. But MetaMask yeah. is a hot wallet. MetaMask is still a private wallet, but it's a hot wallet because it's on a device. When a device is connected to, to the internet, we call it hot. Yeah. Like, um, because you, somebody could find it. Like I got an email, I clicked a link, the link opened, everything was stolen. If you had a cold wallet, you know, it's not even connected to the computer. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I just in the kind of quickly, sorry, just in a defense of quick, quickly before of people born before 1987. <laughs> I'd, also, <laughs> I'd also say, I mean, I'm in that group, by the way. I just want no, to just I know, I know. I, I think there's, there's, two, there's, there's two different schools of thought. It's like, it's, it seems so confusing to, to um, a lot of people regardless. And, um, you know, people that are older it takes a bit longer to, to um, get their head, get, get their head around about how all these things interact and what they're doing but I would say on the flip side I think and we've seen it with say all the meme coins that came out like you know everyone buying doge and ship and all this kind of stuff where there was a number of hacks a social engineering hacks again but it was a lot was they they attracted the younger generation you know the path that whenever they are now beyond millennials and all the rest of it sort of teenagers, almost early 20s, because they are almost so blasé about downloading every app under the sun, not securing stuff, and, and they don't know how, you know, their, their level of awareness is, is almost that they're accepting it to a, such a great great um, degree. They've, they've got such a degree of technology that they kind of go the other way, where it's like there's almost a blasé-ness to it. And, um, you know, I'm sure the first time anyone sent any significant information using, like, a, you know, uh, um, a, a wallet ID, you know, the big long code that you use to send Bitcoin or whatever it is. First time you do that, it's um, the first few times you do it. And I'm, even now, if I'm sending a significant amount, if you still cheat yourself, am I doing it right? Am I not doing it right? But I think everyone got so used to just flipping, moving, using, copy and pasting those addresses and flipping around so blase um, that, you know, anything can happen in that. So there's, a, there's, there's two ends of the argument there. There's, there's not mistrust, but confusion about how all these things are. And or on the other end of the scale, it's like, you know, almost just so, so acceptance and so much trusting around something that, that but the, the net result is the same, that we're not thinking about how to, you know, silo different areas of where we're interacting and create security around them all collectively. Yeah. I will agree with that. And, and that's why through me and Rich's conversations and the living out in player, which has attracted like the world's crypto enthusiasts has really challenged some of my, these, these are hardcore purist, like, you know, the, the our punk, um, the, the punk movement of the origins of crypto. And, and there, uh, the amount of conversations I have just because I have an iPhone I'm basically walking in there with the devil tattooed on me. And it's just really interesting learning their perspectives of it. And I've learned a lot. And that's why I've come to this view of having a, literally a separate form, which I'm going to make sure is very locked and everything. Um, so I think 
but but all of this comes through knowledge. That's why we have these calls. It's to make us go, okay, cool. I'd not thought about that. And and some of the actions to take, like Richard shared at the beginning, <clears throat> the actions just to have a second phone and and oh well, I'll just move my crypto onto it is a is an inconvenience. And most of us are trained, society trains us to just do what's convenient. Pretty much. And, and in crypto, if, you, if you're willing to put the effort in with un- inconvenience, you will be substantially more secure than pretty much everybody else because we just can't be asked with inconvenience. So I want to pull up, um, uh, Neil has asked a really good point on here. He said that he made, we made a good point with security side of things with exchanges, but his concern is the not your keys, not your crypto, or not your keys, not your coins. Uh, Lottie, have you heard that before? That sentence? No? Okay. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos uh, first said that massive crypto guy, super, super, super techie. Um, and, and does some really, really good stuff. So when you create a hot wallet or a cold wallet, you get a really long seed phrase the fella's not even getting into it behind every crypto address is a private key anyone that has the private key for an address can can send and sign that money so you've got public addresses which is the address that we know about it's that really long address we copy and paste but every pr- public address has a private address or every public key has a private key and whoever has access to the private key has the right to send, to, to sign transactions and send money. When you log on to um, an exchange, you're just using a username and password. The exchange has the record of the private keys. You trust the exchange with your money. If I've got a Cookcoin account, Carlos got a Cookcoin account, I've got some Binance accounts, got a thousand dollars in there or whatever. Um, that thousand dollars, in theory, is not mine. I have control over it, but the technical capability to send that money and receive that money is down to KuCoin or Binance or OKEx or whatever exchange someone is using. And so this whole thing of not your keys, not your coins is because there have been so many um, either dodgy companies in the past or unfortunate companies who got hacked, whereby they I'm trusting them to have technical capability to manage it. And someone hacked it and stole the money or the company did a runner because the company has my private keys or rather the company has its own private keys and I trusted it and I sent my money to it. You lose it. So this whole thing of not your keys, not your coins is, is kind of around that. If you're keeping crypto and you're keeping it on an exchange, then you have third party or also known as counterparty risk. That means the risk isn't me. The risk is a third party. And that risk is, do I trust them to do a good job and that they'll still be here in a year and that they are legitimate? And if and, and that's my trust that I'm handing over. So what Neil's saying there is, going back to this level of, you know, how, how what's your technical capability and what you need? If the answer is, it might be safer to use an exchange. He's bringing up, yeah, but what about not your keys, not your coin? Um, and just, Neil, if you can just chat, am I on the right lines there? You're welcome to chirp in here, but I'm just trying to just explain for people that um, might not be as aware. Um, so it makes a good point with it. Um, and so it comes down to this one here, Hello? risk. Yep, go on, Neil. Oh, hey, guys. Um... Happy it's Thursday. <laughs> I've got the day it is. Um, but yeah, no, I think just, uh, you know, like I said, ultimately, you know, and this is something that I love Andreas. He's one of my favorite uh, crypto guys because he's really focused on, um, he's not as much focused on the economics and, and all the pricing. He's more focused on the actual tech and the actual um, benefits that uh, Bitcoin and other crypto can offer. But I think ultimately, like you said, you know, what I've heard and some of my friends that are really um, OGs in crypto is like, not your keys, not your Bitcoin and, or not your 
crypto. So really, that's my concern. I think, you know, if you're holding small amounts on exchanges, especially if you're going to do some like kind of day trading or, or trading on, on a on a regular basis. But if you're going to hold really, you know, large amounts or, you know, want to be super secure, really hardware is, you know, obviously the ultimate option, but not everyone that works for everyone. But I think that's my concern is, um, and what exchanges maybe you can just discuss, you know, because I know a lot of people like crypto or Binance, but like what exchanges would you recommend if you're going to ke- uh, keep um, um, larger amounts. a certain amount in, yeah, large amounts in exchanges. But that's yeah. my kind of concern is if you're going to keep large amounts, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like that kind of balance and, um, you know, of going all the way ultimately to only a hard wall, hardware wallet. But yes, you know, a hardware wallet can, there, there's issues there if you lose that, that seed phrase, but it's like, what's that kind of balance, you know, between the two. And I think everyone's different, like you said, depending on if you're trading, you know, on a regular basis or if you're not. So that was kind of my, my stance on, but, um, but I think ultimately yeah, I, I agree, you know, I think not your keys, not your crypto. Cause you know, the whole thing of sovereign finance is really to, to control you, you know, because if you are on exchanges, it's no different than being on a regular exchange for a stock market, you know, and then, and I've had a, in the past, where I put money into um, a Forex um, dealer and I lost it all because when I went to get it back, they're like, oh, well, you know, the guy already traded it and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so it's, I think just, you know, as we get deeper into the, the, you know, into the, into what's going on here, you know, I think that that for me, ultimately, you know, if you control your keys, you then are in control of your crypto. And um, that's, that's where I, where I, my, I look at it from that stance. Yeah. No, that's really cool can points, I, points, Neil. And uh, go I on, Lottie. On that as well, I was also recommended getting two cold wallets and actually back up on the second one. So, so, so th- th- this is wh- this is where I always dig my heels in a little bit because, like the the crypto meetup, we we have physical crypto meetups every week that have got a mixture of total newbies and then absolute die hardcore enthusiasts. And my, my problem with like maximalist dark hardcore enthusiasts is they're so, they're so fervent on some of the things Neil just shared there. Like, you know, get the cold wallet, you have two of them, have them backed up, get a cold key, have it ingrained in, in metal. And, and these are all incredibly valid, strong points. But when you're dealing with a 55 year old guy or woman who's not very tech savvy, is very keen on getting into crypto. You, you scare the crap out of them and they don't do anything. And that's not good for crypto either, but neither is them putting 200 grand on a random Chinese exchange and losing it all. So we, 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 uh, when you're working through the steps of sovereignty, at the top is a cold wallet backed up, secure, and you fully knowing your shit. That's right at the top, standing in your absolute power. And when someone says, why are you using that cold wallet? You're like, bum, 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 bum. Do you know the risks? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, that's the top of sovereign finance. There aren't a lot of people at the top. I'm not even at the top. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know, crawling halfway up the stairs still with a leg at the bottom. Um, so when, when you're moving into the space, if the, the key point Neil made there was if you have a large amount, which is this third, if I had three hands, I'd use them, but let's leave the middle one for now. Um, this one here is risk. How much money have you got in crypto and how much is that money worth to you? Um, because if you've got, let's say $400, are you going to buy a $250 hard cold wallet? You know, that's, that's 50% of what you're holding. It's just, it's like buying a thousand pound safe to put a hundred pounds in it. It's just, you wouldn't do that. So I think we've got to look at how much is going in um, and what does that mean to you? And then when we started looking, one of the Neil's questions was, what exchanges do you trust? I, I have a couple of exchanges that have got large sums of money in, and I'm going to include Celsius in that. Now it's not an exchange but they're not my keys. So I've got a Celsius account with KYC, so it knows who I am. Um, And I've got a a fairly large, from my perspective, holding in there. But I've done my due diligence on Celsius, and I choose consciously through empowerment to trust it. I choose to trust the CEO because I know who he is. I look at the CEO's track record and history. 
I don't think he's going to do a runner. I think they've got good security. I am about to take out insurance on it anyway, just to be doubly safe and secure. But I look at that and I make my decision that the interest I get paid, uh, the value I call that, is greater than the, val the, the risk that I deem. If it was the other way, I wouldn't keep my money in it. So between Celsius, KuCoin, and Binance, um, I trust them. I have an OKEx account. I, I, I do kind of trust it, but I do not keep much money in it. I use it for transferring, for random coins that I can't get on um, KuCoin and Binance. Other than those th three places, uh, I don't keep money anywhere. Now, that does not mean that some of these other exchanges are no good. But Binance, which CZ owns, I, I don't think he's doing a runner. He's too, it's, it's, he is too big. It's too big. Um, and of all of the exchanges, I probably put Binance in the top in terms of secure. You know, I, I've got multiple levels of security in it. it. It'd be very hard for someone, for me to take money out of Binance takes me five minutes. Between logging in, the security phrases, I have four levels of security just to get the money out of it. Um, so my biggest threat, my only two threats with Binance is Binance doing a runner, which I don't think they will, and Binance getting hacked, which is always a possibility. And I can only mitigate so far against that. So um, I use a mixture of cold wallets for stuff that's not being moved. I use a mixture of hot uh, exchanges because sometimes some of the coins that I've got, I can't even get them on my Trezor or my Ledger. It's just too much of a pain in the ass. So I'll keep it on my exchange. Um, but I'm well aware of the risks that come with that. Uh, and I, I'm not bothered about having a ledger backed up on another ledger. If you have your seed phrase, you don't necessarily need it backed up because I could just buy a device tomorrow, put my seed phrase in it, boom, everything's in it. So um, go on. Maybe it's, 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 I think sometimes people when they're quite new to the space think that the um they they've got their crypto on the cold wallet and and um, there's an important distinction mm. to make there that it's still just the access to it the private key is offline it's like saying you're better in analogies analogies i am dan but you know it's like if, if you use the you know, email it, one it, Essentially, you know, if it's a cold wallet, it's still only an access point to the blockchain. Your crypto, your Bitcoin, whatever it is, is sitting on the blockchain. It's not sitting on any of your devices or the wallets. The wallet is just the access point to the key, literally, to access your funds. Um, same way as if you log into your online banking, you know, your your money that you can see in your online bank is not actually in your device there. It's sitting, supposedly, let's just ignore the fact that I'm going to say this, it's sitting in a bank vault and you're just accessing it via um, your, you know, your online banking. It's, that's the simplest way I can explain it. And the, the, you know, the analogy would be like um, using a cold wallet. It's kind of like, you know, it's not connected to the internet anywhere. So you would have to have it written down and go into the bank and give it to the teller and say, this is the access to my money. It's like no one else has got access to it. It's so private. And there's different, as you go up to hot wallets and all those things, they're connected to the internet. So it's the difference. So it's important distinction to make people understand that when they're new, obviously, that the all these keys are literally just accessing, when all these wallets are literally just accessing your crypto on the blockchain. It's not stored anywhere that you can physically get it it's always an access point um i think the other thing is, is useful just is, before we go further on that did 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 anybody not understand that it's really it's a really important distinction to get in in crypto is your crypto is not on this device and i just want to so just there isn't a person here that says that that thinks that doesn't the penny didn't drop we're all good. Okay, cool. Carry on, Richard. Sorry. I think just in terms of as well, you know, the 
the spread of where you keep things and not, not your keys, not your crypto. I think the longer you're in crypto, the more complicated and the more wallets you will naturally open for different reasons, whether it's privacy, access, you can't buy some crypto without you've got a certain wallet or any of these certain things. So you end up with these multiple places where you will naturally store your crypto, not store your crypto, but store your access to this crypto because of what you're trying to achieve. And if you zoom back out, it's like, well, like Daniel says, you were not going to, there's no point in having $500 of crypto and buying a hardware wallet at that point. It might be quite a good practice to get into it and understand it, but the practicalities around that make it almost irrelevant. So yeah, I think the maximalist will push that, you know, in terms of your sovereign, sovereign finance and all the rest of it. But I think from my perspective, personally, I'll keep of my overall portfolio. And it's, again, it's comes down why you in crypto and what do you need it to do? Because everyone's going to have different reasons, right? Lottie's one at the moment is to specifically to be invested in NFTs, understand them, create your NFTs. That's a whole different reason for, for being in it. So in a way you can kind of like isolate where you, what exchanges you need to interact with that might be specifically around what, what purpose you've got. But from, from my perspective, it's like, I divide my portfolio up and I'll keep some in cold storage and I'll just never touch it because that's my, in my head, that's in a safe, it's locked away and it's a vault. You know, that's my rainy day fund should let the world collapse or whatever it is. The rest of it is doing different things for me. But one structure I've created is, is as you say with Binance or KuCoin, you can have all these different levels of security where you can have the one-time password, you can have your email, you can have your own password, you can have 2FA, you can lock, lock it down with, um, if the IP, if they recognize your IP address changes, then it'll automatically log you out. You can have whitelist addresses, all these different things. So I think you, some, you really need to understand if, you've, if you are trading in any way or you want to exchange some crypto, or you want to sell some crypto, is that the one thing you need to understand as well is that some of these exchanges at busy times when you might want to do stuff will go down so are you storing something that you need to trade on somewhere where potentially when at the peak time, you can't get access to it? So, you know, when exchanges allow you to kind of whitelist, sometimes I've gone to transfer something and oh, now I've got to go through a 10 minute process to unwhitelist my um, thing in order to send it to an address that I hadn't already whitelisted. Does that make sense to people? Any nods for you for that point? But I, so what I've tried to do is create kind of like a grid format so that I've got a hot wallet where I can, that is the whitelist one where I know I can move things too quickly at any point and move them back out if I need to. So I'm going to get blockchain fees and things like that. But from my perspective, um, the whitelisting of, of different exchanges or other um, uh, wallets means that I've always got access to those things. That is super inconvenient, can be, but I think moving in and out, in and out of different um, spaces when you need to, it's only through experience that you realise that it can be massively um, inconvenient and stops you doing what you want to do. So you kind of do have to zoom out sometimes and think, well, what do I need things to do? And that would be, you know, back to where Neil's thing is, you would, you would keep your crypto in places where you think, ah, this, this is here for this reason, not because I've just left it there, you know? So there's got to be some sort of structure to thinking about, well, what am I in this for and what do I need it to do? And don't overcomplicate things until you need to. Those are great points. Thank you, Richard, for that. Lottie, you got to you put your, your hand up or is that a... Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, like, I've made it really... Un unconvenient I've got <laughs> I mean I can't really move very you know everything's really separate but I've also set up a proton email um any does everybody use that I Is use that proton. yeah okay the, the, this is the the the, the thing especially I can feel where this conversation would eventually move to <laughs> which is this whole idea of privacy and decentralization yeah. right which is a, it's a whole nother world. And, and like it, it, never, it never seems to end that this, how do we keep things secure and private and all this sort of stuff. And I think 
the, the more that you can create some separation from you, Lottie, your email, your social media, like that, this online version of who you are, and then crypto. You know, it's only email address, but going as far as having its own phone, going as far and having its own wallets, its own cold wallets. You know, you're talking about getting a separate computer. All of these conversations, each time you make a decision, takes, um, well, at some point breaks away so that there's Lottie and then there's this, this crypto account of Lottie. And it just starts to make more and more stuff. And it gets, you reach the stage where you don't even want to start using exchanges that know that you're you. Then you don't want to use exchanges that are centralized. Then you only start using decentralized exchanges. And the, 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 the rabbit warren does get bigger and bigger. So to loop it all back around, the early stages of sovereignty is just doing whatever you need to get going. And as soon as you're on step two, immediately you start looking at step three and step four and step five. So if you've got a ProtonMail account, if you're thinking of these things, that's really, really, really good. But sometimes some of the solutions are 10 steps ahead and aren't necessarily needed right now, but it's very good to be thinking of them, which is kind of like some of the stuff Richie was just talking about just then. So this, I think what Richard was just what Richard was just talking about is um, if I walk away from this call, that was worth getting on the call for uh, because I need to <clears throat> I need to you know take a second look. You lost him there. Yeah. Another, is that me? You've lost or is what? Sorry, sorry, Joe, you stopped there. Jerry, say that again. Uh, I don't, I'm not really sure where I stopped, but I was, I was saying that I need to uh, reevaluate my security. I've got a, I've got a small house worth of crypto on Bitru right now, you know, and it's um, the power piggies kind of got me earning interest and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, my, I know I've got a lot on Celsius and I, I feel more secure about that, but just to tie a couple of strings together from what you were saying, Richard, is like, I know I've been locked out when I really want to sell or buy something when the market's going crazy, right? That's when all the exchanges go down or they lock you out and, and you're, you're removed from your money. You can't get to it. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk depending on what um, end of the world YouTube channels we all listen to, whether there's going to be a CME or some other kind of attack or what's going to take the grid down. Um, do we feel at that point good that we've got crypto on our on our ledger as we're worrying about drinking water or, you know, or what? But so it depends where we want to go. But, um, you know, to tie it together as being removed from our money, if I'm say the exchanges are fine for once when things are, are, are rushing, but Google, you know, we talk about about privacy and moving towards Proton Mail, and and um, but Google with this two two FA this um, authentication, I don't like Google. I use DuckDuckGo. Um, the whole Alphabet company is something that that you know. I just I, I I try to stay away from. And yet, if Google goes down, and you know, the true is playing with the, along the rules. I've set two FA up, but what if something happens to Google, um, you know, and and the and the two FA doesn't work? If 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 that's what's keeping me from my account, and I I, I recognize that what you said, um, Richard, earlier about, uh, or maybe Daniel about, if you've got your passport, you know, ultimately you can get in, but it might take a week and a half, <laughs> you yeah. know, or two weeks or something, right? So or a month. You know, the security that Google two FA offers is also another another you know, step between you and your money, right? Mm. That, you know, so. The way that, I look at it is, um, is, is, is just in terms of those peak times when things can go down. I mean, the whole apocalyptic thing is, is another. That's another story. <laughs> that's another story, right? You can, like you say, you're going to care about having your trays. You, you, can, you can put stuff on your trays if you're trying to find food and stuff, I guess. <laughs> you're not going to care. But I think the way I kind of look at it is, is a good, a good practice is to have a hot wallet as the place where you either store the tradable crypto or um, create that as the whitelist where everything can, can, can go through. So, so you can funnel you, it. So you can funnel it. So it's like a funnel. 
And then you can have your Binance, you can have you can have multiple Binance accounts. I've got four or five Binance accounts to keep me under the KYC threshold. Or you can have an FTX, which I'm playing with at the moment, which seems pretty good, and a KuCoin one. So I've got different exchanges, but they again, it's for me, it's like, well, these this is my reason, this is the proportion of my crypto, my portfolio that I need to do something with at a certain point. That's in my plan, right? But it's creating a funnel to those places. There's not, so there's not a lot sitting on exchanges, but I can get it to there should any of them fail. And you can go and check that. If I can't get into Binance, then I'll go then to KuCoin. If I go from KuCoin, I'll go to FTX. So you, it's useful to have those open. But for, to me, it's like my everything from my cold wallet to Celsius to uh, all this stuff is whitelisted so it can go through that hot wallet funnel. And um, I think Carlos says there, what hot wallet do you recommend? I think um, for me, it's either Atomic or or Exodus. I think they're both pretty good. So, Oh, do you know what? I thought she'd said cold wallet. I didn't realise she'd said hot wallet. Hmm. So yeah, Trezor oh. in terms of the cold, cold wallet is definitely the one to go for above Ledger, I'd say. Do you stake through those wallets or do you just say to yourself, I'm not going to worry about staking on exchanges or, or I have uh, myself in a stake and that's where I'm comfortable? Yeah, well, it depends. Again, it's like which bits of my crypto do I allocate for staking? Say, for example, Cardano, I it's staked through. That's, I've moved that into my long-term holding now. So I'll keep that. Um, I've, I've put that into a, a stake pool, staking pool, basically, and it's just going to sit there until whatever you know to whatever time but i don't stake on exchanges at the moment because um it's not through a lack of trust because i think like daniel says i think a lot of them have got way more to lose now than you know they're too big to fail almost the likes of binance and stuff i mean i'm seeing a lot of people bitching moaning around binance you know in terms of like withholding funds of deposits not arriving and the customer service being shitty and all this kind of stuff um, and everyone's talking about FTX. I still see KuCoin's good, but I, I feel a little bit uneasy. I think the staking on some of those exchanges can be good, but I don't know enough about the kind of liquidity liquidity type of stuff because that's essentially what you're doing, isn't it? On a lot of the exchanges, you're providing liquidity. So if there's a crash, you, that's the bigger risk. So, um, so some of those staking things it's a personal choice at the end of the day. But I, I you. Know, it, you've got a reason for why that's on the on the exchange. And I suppose that's the question you've got to ask yourself and really look at it because it's interest rates and all these things are changing on on so on such a quick basis now that you might be able to, be able to get a better rate somewhere else. And then it's a good thing to say I'll remove that from that exchange and find a better place. You know, in terms of managing money and portfolio and things like that. So, so I don't think you necessarily distrust them, but my experience is every time you need them, they go down. <laughs> so, you know, create a funnel if you can. I think it's probably the only thing a, a good enter. a good solution though for stuff like that is the minute you start using decentralized exchanges, they don't go down when there's ups and downs, because on a decentralized exchange they're not holding your money. The reason these sites go down when prices change is because, in my opinion, they're they don't want a big exit of people selling. They don't want money being taken off. When you're on a decentralized exchange, it connects directly to your cold wallet. So these things never go down because they're not, they're only, they're just relying on people connecting in and trading and then disconnecting. There's no funds held on them. So um, if you've got your money in a cold wallet and then you wish to suddenly buy or suddenly sell with a big market change, you're totally fine. And uh, my favorite decentralized exchange is Shapeshift, but there's quite a few. But you can feel very trusted and safe with them because when you're finished doing what you're doing and you disconnect your cold wallet, you know, you're, you're done. It's like, a, it's like a temporary space where you're going and making a trade. Um, I don't use them often, but I'm wanting to start to use them more and more as, as I go on my personal crypto journey. So I'm sharing that because, again, there's a, a time and a place for hot wallets, cold wallets, exchanges. Um, sites like celsius and decentralized exchanges and if you can be aware of them all and why you would use one why you wouldn't use one i think the whole space starts to become clearer um and it'll be different again in 12 months time won't it you know it'll be totally different so you gotta kind of move with the times as well 
Yeah, definitely. Shape shift for me. Okay. Let's have a pause for a minute. Because I only asked Lottie if uh, for a bit of feedback on on that on that Twitter hack. Uh, however, what, what ironically is we have absolutely discussed Security. the whole purpose and topic of why we came on here to discuss, and and it is such a such a big topic, it really is. Um, it would be good to just talk about the news but before we do that, because um, I know Rod had specifically questions. I'm sure on um, Rod had a pair question, and I promised Rod I'd answer that pair question for you. So I'm, I want to park that for a minute. But before we move on, this last topic of security and exchanges and stuff, does anybody have a burning thing that doesn't make sense that's come up because of what we've talked about? I want to make sure everyone leaves at least more knowledgeable but settled. There's no point you leaving with a big thing that's unanswered anyone got that oh good going once going twice sold to the next topic okay so rod asked a question a couple of days ago about like a couple of calls ago about trading pairs and he expanded that question um when he signed up today and he said trading pairs what are they why are they used? Why is it so hard to buy crypto with fear? Which made me then understand a little bit more about where his question was coming from. Uh, is that still a relevant question, Rod, anyway? Yeah? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. Um, sites like... Uh, begins with C, it's blue. Crypto.com. Sites like Crypto.com don't use trading pairs. They just basically, they're holding loads of coins and they know what the exchange rate is between any particular coin or fiat currency. And so if I say I want to sell Ethereum into Dogecoin, um, then I can just sell it. And crypto.com will just, just work out what the, what the exchange rate is. So trading pairs don't exist on sites like crypto.com because their aim is to just make things simpler and they make sure they're holding uh, enough enough coin and to be fair i reckon sometimes they don't even hold enough coin they don't care as long as they've got enough money it's just a it's, for them it's just a database transaction and they're just saying okay rod sold an ethereum now he's got this much dodge so long as they've got enough money that when you want to exit they can actually give you that dodge they're fine. They might not actually make a change. But traditionally, on an exchange, um, just like from the old foreign exchange industry, you would have a trading pair. You would have an Ethereum ETH with a line, and then it would say BTC, Bitcoin. And so for that trading pair, you're actually trading Ethereum to BTC, and this is the rate. And Binance can do that because they have enough liquidity. That means they've got enough Ethereum in the pot and they've got enough Bitcoin in the pot. If they didn't have a lot of Bitcoin and you went to make a trade, if no one is selling Bitcoin for that amount, no trade is made. It just sits there as an order. Wait, you know, if, if, I'm, if I want to sell Ethereum for this price and someone in, into Bitcoin and someone's only willing to sell it for this price, there's a gap. No trade occurs because it's a, it's, it's a dry market. When there's thousands of Bitcoin and thousands of Ethereum, there's always enough and, 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 mon and trades keep happening. Um, and they only create a pair when they have enough liquidity. And so, for example, if you want to buy TVK, which is Terra Virtual Network on Bitcoin, you can't buy that with USDT. You can only buy it with Binance's coin because that's where the liquidity is. So I have to trade my USDT into Binance coin, into Binance USD, then I can buy TVK. So Rod's question is like, why can't you buy lots of crypto with fiat? The answer is you just can't. The amount of liquidity they would have to provide for the thousands and thousands of coins that Binance has got against GBP, USD, Canadian dollar, Aussie dollar, there's just not enough people holding fiat in Binance 
to provide enough liquidity for BTC, which is why Tether is the number one most liquid coin on the market. Um, Tesla, Tesla cars have got something like 400 million miles, probably more now, but I'm sure it's like nearly like a bit, half a billion miles clocked up with their cars. They've got so much data from all of their senses that their AI to create self-driving cars is the same as when you watch a running race or a bicycle race. You know that front of the pack where you might have a couple of people and then you have this big gap and then you've got everyone else. It's almost impossible for everybody else to close that gap and reach the front of the pack. When that front of the pack breaks, it breaks. It's gone. It's ahead. Tesla is so far ahead in terms of data collected that for other car companies to catch up is really hard. Tether was first on the market. Tether has got such a market share across all exchanges, all trading pairs, that it's pretty much impossible at this stage for USDC, which is the competitor of Tether, to catch up. I think USDT has got like a couple of uh, like million or billion, but a couple of million, but Tether's like 21 billion. I mean, it, it, it's it's not even in the same league. So if you're going to bring a coin onto an exchange, you're going to pair it with USDT, which is a crypto coin, because that's where the liquidity is. Um, so if you're looking to buy crypto with fiat, usually just convert your fiat into USDT and you'll be able to buy everything. So I try to do that really fast. Rod, does that make sense? Why you can't buy much crypto with fiat and um, what a trading pair is and how to actually buy any coin you want? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, the answer is um, easily yes and no. Um, <clears throat> interesting, you, you mentioned crypto.com because I spent ages the other day trying to figure out how I could actually put fiat into crypto.com. And I don't think it's possible. So oh, that's it's fully possible. Well, I, I, I couldn't figure out. I couldn't figure out any way to do it. I mean, the, the, some of the, um, uh, the, the just get uh, get get a pen and paper. Get a pen and paper and just write this down. Yeah, is this to do with fiat wallet? Yeah, you click fiat wallet. Yeah. Click add fiat even wallet. Find, couldn't even find crypt, uh, fiat wallet. It just wasn't there on the site. So when you load crypto, you, you know about crypto.com, the app, yeah. Uh, I used it on my laptop. Ah, no, right. So that's not crypto.com. That's crypto.com's exchange. They're two different platforms. So ah. crypto.com, crypto.com for retail investors with fiat banking is an app only. That's why you couldn't find it. Crypto.com, as in www.crypto.com, is an exchange that, as far as I'm aware, is crypto only. Okay. So are these the same people? Yes. Right. So my um, uh, my p personal details are valid for both of those then. No, two different two different users. I believe you can link them up though, can't you? There's a way to do it. Let's say just since I set yeah. mine up, and I don't really use it. I've only used Crypto.com for one reason, and so I don't. But I, I could really I couldn't link mine. <clears throat> so it, it it asks you to log in, and then it says enter your details for Crypto.com app. And then your crypto.com app is meant to flag up to say, hey, someone's trying to connect the app, the exchange to the app, and you press approve. Mine never comes up. So I just, I don't really use it anymore, and I've given up on crypto.com. So, um, okay. but they're totally okay. different settings. Right. Well, that's I'll come to you in a second, one. Lottie. Thank yeah. you. That, that has answered that one. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to try and do anything like that because of the experience I had with Binance quite a while ago, actually. I ended up accidentally with two Binance accounts. Having started up the Binance account on my laptop, it then instantly presented me with a QR code, which I scanned onto my phone, thinking that that was the same account. Turned out it wasn't. Two Binance accounts. So I bought some crypto on one Binance account and then wondered why the hell it wasn't there on the other one. And then Binance was telling me I couldn't actually log into one because I wasn't validated on it. So, you know, kind of a nightmare, but a really good learning curve and now i understand how that works yeah yep, so no, thank you well, I, I, 
that's answered a lot of questions actually daniel thank you yeah yeah good good good, good. Uh, lottie what was your question on whilst we're talking about crypto.com yeah no because i um I just set up crypto.com as well, but to, I'm pretty sure that I have the same account because I had to, to open up uh, the .com on the computer. I had to get some information from my phone, uh, like a but, code uh, or maybe, something. Maybe. You, you, well, I was saying you can link them. They can. You, I, I think when you're logging into you the exchange now, last time I looked, it said, it said, do you already have an account? So oh, I think right. you can click yes, and I think you can put it in. So um, hmm. they, they probably are much more linked than when I tried it a year ago. Um, but they're definitely separate. If I have 100, pound, 100 BTC in crypto.com, I don't yeah. think that that hundred is on the crypto.com exchange. I think they're different um, platforms holding different amounts. You're just using the same login details to log into both. I don't think it's transferable. You don't log in here and see what's on there, but it might have changed. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. So if you find out that information, please do share it. Um, it's good to just kind of update on these things. There are so many exchanges. It is impossible to keep fully abreast of everything. Um, so um, that answers that. It is half past. I am very cautious of overrunning, but I do feel a pressing part of me that wants to kind of spend a couple of minutes talking about the market. I don't know if Richard, what are you doing for time? Uh, I'm right for a stuff. short while. Yeah. You do 10 minutes. Might, I've got a someone you, coming, but I don't have to jump off. I might have to jump off. Just because it's one of these to, things so. we're, we're going to try and um, when it gets to the hour, which was half an hour ago, um, like call an end to whatever topic we're discussing and just talk about the markets. However, we were so deeply enthralled in that last conversation that I kind of yes. felt it was best to just let it naturally find its end, because especially because it's so big. Um, but Rod asked a question in the chat. What did he say? What's going on with the crypto market right now? Are we going to float up and down for a while? Or are we going to crash or are we going to fly? Rod basically wants to know what's the golden answer. He wants the, 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 uh, well, I'll tell you what else we can answer. Uh, not Rod, sorry, Clive asked that. Uh, we could also cover the meaning of life. Um, and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and where's the I'm golden just... goose? <laughs> and what is gravity, by the way? <laughs> and what is... <laughs> um, all right, so well, let's do a bit of a round robin. Because um, me and Richard, since the last time we had a call, we've had a massive dump. Well, are there any uh, other some... quant holders out there? I've are got there any other quant. Yeah, I've got hundreds of those things, and it went crazy this week. So I was thrilled. I'm thrilled. <laughs> um, something's always going crazy, but I think it's really good to discuss El Salvador. I think let's just quickly cover the market, and then let's end with our, our speculations of things, because the market was already crazy, and it's, it's only gone one way. So we're going to call this the air and chair part of the call. Came up with that today. So um, what's going on? I'm going to give my view for it. I'll try and do it in two minutes. Um, I, I think there's tons and tons and tons of adoption right now and really, really good stories, like El Salvador as an example. But I, I don't think we're going to get away at this stage from the backlash, from the pushback from traditional finance, whether that is uh, the IMF, International Monetary Foundation, whether it's banks, Rothschilds, Rockefellers, JP Morgan, you know, old money um, that has ruled the roost for a long time. And I'm not coming from a nefarious point of view, but these are the people that create money. So I think we are getting massive adoption. But my personal view is I, I don't think we're at the retail space of crypto. I think we're still at massively at institutional space. And what for as long as we're at institutional space, I think it is logical especially when you see how much the markets are manipulated, that there will be a concerted effort 
to create a dump that is pretty big, maybe the biggest we've ever seen, to create so much fear so that all those institutions can snap up. This is my personal view. So I see all sorts of adoption, but um, I am waiting on the sidelines for a 12 to a 15K Bitcoin. I just, um, I, I just think it's going to happen. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So I've got a portion of my crypto yeah. that I exited and, and I would normally never do that. So that's my personal view on what's going to happen. I think it'll be in the, I think it'll be in this year. And I think we'll see the top of a bull cycle. Let's say the next six months, a really big dump, some consolidation, then up. And the start of next year, we'll, we'll see some sort of a peak. That's my two cents. Who's going next? We only got two or three minutes max, if you want to have a go. Richard? Okay. Um, I think in terms of the short term, it feels like we're just in this accumulation phase at the moment. I don't, it, it could go either way, but I think we've got reasonable support in this, you know, five to 10, five, to five, five grand either side of where we are at the moment. Could be totally wrong and, and the rest of it, but Bitcoin is still driving market. Bitcoin dominance is now taking back over. So I think that, you know, we need to see Bitcoin do what it needs to do in, in, in terms of influence and the rest of the market to a greater degree, unless you're in some thing like quant or any of these sort of things that are just, you know, some projects that it feels like a bear market like that in terms of like projects that just do go crazy. That's what happens in a bear market while everything else is still trying to find its feet. Um, I think what it's done for, and I, and I think we are going to see Bitcoin, uh, sorry, crypto manipulation. The markets are going to get manipulated as more and more um, uh, institutions come on, I think. But it, it, even Wall Street is saying they're buying certain Bitcoins now. Um, even Paul Tudor Jones has come back and set out. And, uh, you know, it, it's just the, 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 the adoption of it is just crazy. From my point, I, El, the El Salvador news for me was the happiest I've been. It made my week, basically, that did, because, and it made me completely re-engage um, with what I believe, why I believe Bitcoin was so powerful in the first instance. Those 6 million people can now own, if, you know, if it goes through, and as it should do, they can now own, spend their own money from a fixed supply, and they're going to get off the dollar. And they're getting crucified by the IMF in the US at the moment in terms of threats and all sorts of things but the brilliant thing is when you look at it is the bitcoin community is is coming behind them and saying we're going to support you to get this through so that's the first domino that's going to fall and the smaller countries are all like tanzania is, is an african country i think we'll see more of those um and a lot of the central american countries that are reliant on the dollar but have can take back their own sovereignty um it, it's, it's just huge so you know, in terms of way in buying and selling, I think, you know, it's probably, you know, we are going to have to see these, see these big drops and things. But I think the other thing I've realized at the moment is that um, the power of, I think it, it pops up in the chat is, you know, when you speak to people and they're wondering when to buy or they've bought at the 50 of K and it's like they're crying now about <laughs> and questioning their entire life around things. You cannot F with, dollar cost averaging right you know if you did that with a plan at the start you would be you know you wouldn't be stressed at all basically and you, and, and and it's a lesson to me as well to think why am i trying to worry about some of these things when i've got my positions already and dollar cost averaging is just is just it's what you believe if you know find what you believe in and buy those things all the time so i think it's an exciting time at the moment just to see i mean even i think tezos have um, sponsored McLaren F1 team today. So it's just crazy. Wow. It's absolutely crazy that these things are, are now, you're going to see these things spinning around Formula One tracks, you know, advertising these sort of things. So at that level, it's just new territory for, for crypto massively. I know that wasn't too minutes, and I apologise. <laughs> I live in Mexico. Two minutes is a very abstract term. Um, anybody want to cast there? Their thoughts? I thought it was interesting. I saw somewhere over the last week that the World Economic Thor uh, Forum, <clears throat> somebody leaked a, a PDF or whether it was a leak or it was just exposed, I don't know. But it talked about the World Economic Forum recognizing 
um, a list of cryptos. They mentioned XRP, XLM, Algo, Solana. Um, I can't remember if Tezos was in that list or not, but it was, uh, if I, I think it was an orange and purple kind of covered document, like if anybody sees it floating around. But the fact that <clears throat> Algorand was mentioned and Algo, if you look at, you know, who's making partnerships and what kinds of things are happening out there, I've, I've got a lot to learn on DeFi, but I'm a pretty big XRP holder. So when the flare um, airdrop uh, occurred, um, you know, I was certainly present for that. So anything that's happened to flare related, um, you know, I've always kept an eye on. I've got a lot of Litecoin too. So when that was entered, that when that was brought in, that was good. But I heard there's a vote going on now in the flare group as to whether to bring Algorand in. And Algorand has um, partnered with XRP and they've partnered with some other you know, big, big players. And the, when you look at World Economic Forum, like those are, you know, I, th I don't think those people are clean by any means, but they do run the world, right? They run the money. And when they're talking about a handful of cryptos, it may, it may, um, you know, do, do us, you know, do us good to be paying attention. I did find oh, uh, I like that. I, I, I saw that article as well. Go on, Richard. I did actually, sorry, I saw a, a thing that's just a, 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 thing, you know, a little bit of a cautious note, I guess, is the SEC are now going to start investigating a whole, there's, there's a whole list of cryptos that they're going to follow with the XRP suit, if it, depending on how that goes through. Are there securities? Are they you know, currency? What are they going to do? Uh, and Tether is, Tether is one of them inevitably because they, you know, they want they want to they want their CBDCs to replace Tether ultimately, don't they? If if we move into this space here, so um, so that's another thing to sort of keep cautious. What I want to do is just I want to go to Lottie at the end who wants to say something on NFTs, but I want to relate it back to Carla who I hope's listening. As Carla said something that's really important when we spoke to her at the beginning, she said um, she was looking at things and then saw the dump and she's I think she said I got a bit deflated, um, which is like totally natural, especially when you're getting into crypto. I've had so many friends in the last month contact me and messages like, like chicken licking. Oh my God, the sky is falling down. Um, and so that's why you've got to get really good on like, why am I here? And um, anyone that I've helped get into crypto has been for the same reason, long-term. But people forget that because we're, especially in the early days of crypto, crypto is like dating. You're in this honeymoon period. You're All you can think about is crypto and you're just, checking everything and, and talking about it. And so uh, for Carl, I like to feel deflated about things. Just to remember that long-term, nothing's changed. The fundamentals are still the same. Like we're, st we're still, we still have the same issues we have with traditional finance. Blockchain's only getting bigger, stronger, more adoption. Is the price a bit manipulated at this stage? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of financial manipulation that goes on in the world. But if, 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 We've used it before now, you know, graphy, arrow, pointy, uppy, uppy. We're going that way. We always have been going that way. But along the way, there's these moments where they say they're shaking the weak hands from the tree. And I, I've been away sometimes, come back for a month after a month, looked and realized I've missed a 60% dip back up again. And I think, crap, I, I missed that emotional roller coaster. These things happen all the time. So if you're going to check your crypto or, or be looking at it, be aware that that's going to come with some feelings, but also realize that if you're going to get in and you're looking at buying for three, five, seven years, it doesn't matter. It's like buying a house. If the house price crashed tomorrow, that's okay. You live in it. You're not selling it. So it's, it's just remembering that because when you see it dip, try and train yourself to think, ooh, it's cheap. Not I've lost money. Um, which is one of the reasons why now I, I train myself to keep money on the side because I didn't dollar cost average in and I wished I did. I really, really wished I did. Um, so I keep some money on the side now to be able to at least pick up or drip feed in every now and again. Um, so try not to feel deflated about it because we're all moving in the right, it's all moving in the right direction. And these are just really good opportunities to buy and they are standard. A four-year cycle, Bitcoin will have a couple of, uh, all coins will have a couple of um, gut-wrenching drops. I just wanted to pass that on. Uh, Lotte, you wanted to, you said, can you have two minutes to talk about NFTs? 
Yeah, because one of my questions was uh, today as well. I know it's about security and everything, but if there is any NFT uh, investors here, because I had some questions. I don't know if anybody is investing in a in a NFTs. No, you I, are. I, I've got some NFTs and platforms, and I've helped a few people mint NFTs. So if they're quick okay. fire questions, go for them. Okay, so I was just like wondering why, obviously you got them for the exchange that you did or the help, but um, I was just like wondering what your motivation was and why you are investing in NFTs. Uh, well, I want to just break it out. I, I invest in NFT platforms because right. I believe I believe that that's a good investment for the future. Um, mm. I own rareable coins, um, things like that, rareable tokens, um, because I just think these platforms. You want Jerry? Oh, I sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, you did mention TVK okay. earlier. Yeah, uh, TVK. There's, there's uh, anything that's trying to be the platform where NFTs are on. I'm interested in, yeah, or even like things like Engine Coin, who are looking to make in-game collectibles. Um, I don't own an NFT. If that makes yeah. sense, like, yeah. so I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in. Um, I know people that do, but I'm just not. Um, I, I'm not interested, and I also made the decision that I don't have the time to understand it enough. You know, I might spend a hundred dollars, and if I did that, it would be purely to to go through the process to be able to buy one. Yeah, but in terms of buying it, to see you later, Rod. Thank you very much. In terms of um, uh, buying NFTs in, for investment purposes or because I like the NFT, it's not a space I'm in at the minute. Right. I'm more interested in the platforms themselves. I believe in NFTs, um, but it is a very early market. And uh, I won't buy an NFT because I'm a little bit cautious of just how big this proverbial bubble might be. But I do think it's going to be here for forever. It's going to change everything. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, like, it's early days. But I just thought also if anybody is interested in, you know, because I have been spending months and months and months preparing for my own um, NFT kind of entry point. And uh, I've been watching the market very closely. And it is... A bubble but you know what really exploded nfts into the kind of consciousness was uh christie's sale of people's 96 million pound um yeah. but uh what i want to say so last week there was um sotheby's has now come on board and they did um an auction last week where it was 17 million pounds sold of NFTs. And one of them was quite significant because it was an early ape. I don't know if anybody heard about the apes, but it's this, this investor, he bought it very early on, back in 2017, he sold for 10 million pounds uh, and it made him a millionaire over <laughs> overnight. Um, so it's it's exciting times in the NFT space, but it's like crypto. It's it's change it, it changes from week to week. It's over flooded mm. by people who um, are I would say wannabes, creatives and artists. Um, but I think you know the people who have been artists prior to this or are in for the long run is uh, gonna stay. Um, but yeah, and also I'm a part of next week, I am a part of the, it's called the Every Woman Biennial. And it's the biggest drop of female artists to date. So it's 300 artists, female artists being uh, dropped onto uh, OpenSea uh, by a NFT gallery in New York. So it's the first physical gallery that deals in NFTs as well. Um, nice. So can, can anyone get in on that? Because I've got some female artists that are doing NFTs. Is it already locked down or can you share any yeah, information on it? So it, it? It was an open call um, and it's all, yeah, it's all, 
they're, they're, they're uploading it all now, but I just thought I mention it because it well, is very just connect you to... and very exciting. <laughs> so yeah, what's that your name one. on? What's your name on tele on the Telegram channel? I think it's Lottie Col Lottie Lottie Carlson. Yeah. Four women tomorrow. I'm just going to connect you with another dear sister on on there. Um, be mm. good for you two to chat a little bit more. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's where NFTs is going is is really really big. Not just in art but in music licensing, in IP licensing, in in-game collectibles, in top, when, you know, when Pokemon come on the scene, which they are doing, whether it's this year or not, I don't know, but as soon as Pokemon come as well, I grew up with trading card games, you know, physical cards and Magic the Gathering. Now it's all just going to be on, on apps and you'll put goggles on and you'll see your Pokemon in 3D and you can run with him and it's going to mm. be... It's going to be insane where it's going. And that's why anyone that thinks th there are bits of bubbles within it, I think around the price of art, because people just want to grab it. Um, but the same thing I said to my friend that got into it is you can mint an NFT, but if you haven't got reach, if you're not doing marketing, like you can't just assume you can throw an NFT on OpenSea and you'll just sell it for millions. Like you, there's, there's groups you can go into, but you've got to put work into it. But if you're in it for the long run, like anything in crypto right now, if you, if you make your bed, you stake your position, you put your flag down and you know which direction you're going and you stick to it, you'll do really, really well within it. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. And whilst Ethereum is cheap, a lot of if I could give you one piece of advice if you've not minted yet, mint as much as you can. You don't need to declare it and release it onto the open sea. My friend was minting when Ethereum fees were like 160 quid. Now they're so cheap, she is just, she is minted as much as she can because it's so cheap. Because when you start to see how much it costs to mint, it is a bit bonkers. So that's the one thing I would say if you're going to start to mint, um, make the most of it. You know, make hair while the sun shines and it's really, really cheap. Mm. Cool. Let's leave it at that. We're, we're over 20 minutes. I just wanted to cover a few things there. And I'd forgotten about the NFT stuff, Lottie. So thank you for just bringing that up. I know you wanted to discuss it. Um, Okay, people. So we've covered plenty there. Uh, a lot of stuff on security and privacy and, well, not privacy, but on exchanges and wallets and things, which is what we came on to discuss. They're really, really, really big topics. Um, but the more we discuss them, the wider they get, the more knowledge we get. And like I said, right at the very beginning, like we want to make sure that our knowledge is is greater than, well, at least the last one. You can have better tech, but you've got to understand what it is that you're working with because this is crypto. This is sovereign finance. You are the, the person your finance has been waiting for in a way. Um, and you are the person that can control and look after and manage it all. And there's no, uh, there's no back doors or people that we can go crying to at the end, at the end of all this. So if we can learn and grow together and move through all this, we can unplug some of those proverbial plugs from traditional finance and plug more into crypto and, and fundamentally have a system which is fairer. And by fairer, it's because we all have more control over it. We don't have control over traditional finance. We are mainly served a product and that's it. Whereas within crypto, we have we can, we can make the products and totally move things how we wish to move things. And that is, for, as far as humanity is concerned, that is a massive breakaway. I can send money now to any mobile phone in any country in minutes um with minimal fees and then again that is just revolutionary so we exist within this space myself and richard to open up that dialogue more to help people actually work out how on earth do i do that uh, and through having these conversations we also open things up on technology on nfts on um wallets on privacy on all sorts of stuff and, uh, and i hope that everyone that keeps coming back to these calls can feel that and feels that we do have a supportive community. And uh, we do encourage and ask, if you know people that are interested or want to get into crypto or have been burnt, please do share the group with them. It's only through the group growing that we can help to do our little bit to increase adoption. So for our new call time, I hope that's been useful for people. I hope this call's been useful um, uh, from myself, uh, from Richard. I say thank you very much. Enjoy your time in crypto. Enjoy your week, and we'll speak to you in a couple of weeks. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.